So Rick, it, it sounds like, and we've reviewed a bunch of data for the Pomora agents, it really sounds like this is, has been a game changer for opioid-induced constipation. Um, tell me what you think are some of the, the advantages and where this might fit in a, a workflow for managing this. Right, so we have talked a lot about it, David. I think the, the reality is the, the fact that these drugs work against the problem that's caused by the opioid we're giving, right? We're treating a side effect of opioids, and that is constipation. We know it's the most common side effect, and it often is the most distressing one for the patient. So I think the PEMORs have worked, and what I tell my fellows again is just, you're, you're going to the source of the problem and treating it sort of mano y mano, if you will, and, and how you combat it. So I think that's been the biggest um, rationale for it, and I think, again, the efficacy is borne out in the clinical trials. And I always say, though, the trials are one thing. Clinicians make judgments based on their experiences, right, what they see in their clinics. And I think the fact that these drugs have had a quite a robust use in the clinic supports that they're efficacious and that the patients do use them in a real-world setting. And that's been our experience with it. So again, uh, I do think the other things we've talked about, whether it's OSCs or secretagogues or just lifestyle changes are important and occasionally are sufficient. For the most part, PEMORs have been a game changer, as you said, for our patients who suffer from OIC. Jeff, you started talking about this earlier in deciding between Relistor or the other PEMORA agents. Um, how would you recommend we approach considering one drug over another in this class? I think first it's important to recognize that all three of them work well um, in treating opioid-induced constipation. Uh, one of the things that we sometimes need to consider is what a third-party payer uh, has on as a preferred agent. Um, and so um, we need to be smart about how we select these. So for, for example, uh, if, if the um, preferred agent was Movantic, Movantic uh, is metabolized by, by CYP3A4, which we talked about, and also depends on peak glycoprotein for absorption. Uh, it does have a contraindication for strong uh, inhibitors of 3A4. So if the patient's on itraconazole, for example, we need to be very careful and, and make the argument that um, it would not be appropriate to use a Movantic because it's a contraindication. If, on the other hand, the patient was on a strong inducer, uh, such as carbamazepine, one way to get around that would be to switch carbamazepine to oxcarbazepine. Uh, so that would be uh, you know, one way of getting around it. The other thing you can do is you can select a different Pomora if you have that latitude, all right? So um, that would leave then Zimproic, or well, it would leave uh, Relestor. So Zimproic also depends on 3A4 and p like a protein, does not have the contraindication uh, for 3A4 inhibitors, uh, but it is a caution in the package insert. So that's gonna be important. Um, and of course, peak glycoprotein drugs for either, um, either Zimpro Zimproic or, um, or Movantic. Um, the uh, Relistor uh, does not uh, have any significant interactions with any of the CYP enzymes. Uh, yes, it is in fact a substrate for CYP2D6, and it is a weak inhibitor of 2D6, but the studies that have been done have not shown there to be any drug interactions whereby the dose would need to be adjusted. So that's important. Um, one of the things that should be considered with Relistor, however, is that if you consume a fatty meal, it can decrease absorption by 50%. Um, and because of that, the recommendation is to dose it 30 minutes before a meal uh, on an empty stomach if possible. Um, other considerations, uh, particularly um, in the elderly patient, we may see this, uh, for, for uh, Relistor, um, the, the dose should be adjusted downward from 450 once a day to 150 once a day in patients who have a uh, creatinine clearance of 30 or less. Um, and that's not necessarily pro problematic. In fact, it may be an advantage uh, in patients who have compromised kidney function uh, to start on a third of the dose. Um, Likewise, if a patient is on Movantic and um, there's a concern because the patient is on a moderate uh, enzyme inhibitor, uh, then the recommendation is to start them on 12.5 milligrams instead of 25 milligrams. So again, in summary, they all uh, work well, all right? But there are nuances in all of them, particularly with the pharmacokinetics 
that should be considered in selecting an agent. Jeff, I don't know if you would agree with this or the other panelists. One thing for me when I'm considering these drugs as well is if a patient got Relistor methyl naltrexone in the sub-Q form, and this happens with my palliative care patients, and they come to me and they weren't started on an oral, I really like to stay with the same molecule. So they tell me the sub-Q worked. That's the time I'll push hardest on the payer if they want to try to say one versus the other. It just seems to me to make sense as a clinician. Let's not, let's not switch drugs if you had one that worked in, a, in one dosage. And, and as we know, methyl naltrexone is the only PAMOR that comes in two dosage forms. So I think that is one consideration I give in that kind of special class of patients. So that could be an easier sell, I think. You know, I'm saying that patients are beyond that, but, but just, um, uh, just to be clear, all three of these have a similar financial nucleus. So, so from a, from a uh, perspective of intolerance or allergy should not be an issue. I don't disagree with what you said, um, but uh, sometimes people will say, I like to stay in the same drug because I know that they'll tolerate it. I don't see that as an issue so much, but again, with the interactions with some of the others that we don't necessarily see with methanoltrexone, then yes, I think that it is smart to stay with the same drug if you're able to do that. Right, and maybe it's not fair just to say just on the efficacy standpoint, but there, we, these drugs can reverse analgesia. And so I think, again, one thing for me to think about is, is staying with the same molecule just so that I don't possibly cause them problems with the other one.